Good evening and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We're excited to welcome Andrea Carpenter, Chief Operating Officer with Compliance Training Partners as our speaker tonight, as she will review all things HIPAA, including how to protect yourself and your practice. At any point during tonight's webinar, as this is a super important topic, we certainly encourage your participation via Q&A. Please type any questions you might have into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the presentation. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Henry Schein's Dental Business Institute, as well as Compliance Training Partners. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me and learning a little bit about how to protect yourself and your practice uh, for, with HIPAA and HIPAA inspection. So just a little bit about the objectives for today, a summary of what we're gonna be going over. Uh, we're gonna start out talking about HIPAA best practices, things that we can incorporate in our facilities to make sure that we are being HIPAA compliant. We're also gonna talk a little bit about HIPAA citations and fines that we may encounter um, if we aren't following some of these best practices. We'll explain a little bit about HIPAA inspection uh, processes and what happens if a HIPAA inspection were ever to take place in your facility. And then I'm gonna finish up uh, talking about conducting uh, an assessment of your current HIPAA compliance in your facilities. And at the end, I've got a great resource that I wanna share with you so that you can do so after you leave this training uh, today. So first, I just want to start out a uh, little bit of review uh, for some of you. Uh, what is HIPAA? So HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, uh, which became a federal law that was designed to protect sensitive patient information known as protected health information or PHI. Uh, so protected health information is really anything from a patient's name to their social security number, uh, anything that has to do with their health history. So it was an act that got established in order to protect this information, make sure that we as dental providers are keeping it safe, uh, but it also allowed patients to have easier, have an easier time accessing their records. Before it was very hard for patients to get access to their dental records or medical records. Uh, this act also, however, made um, payments simpler for healthcare providers to obtain, which is good. And as far as who needs to comply with HIPAA, uh, HIPAA states that covered entities and business associates are two groups that really need to follow these HIPAA laws. Uh, the HIPAA Act was developed by the Department of Health and Human Services uh, and the office that oversees it, kind of manages it, makes sure that everybody's doing what they should be, um, oversees inspections is the Office of Civil Rights. So the best practice I wanna talk about, it's very important, is to make sure that we're conducting training of all team members. As healthcare providers in the dental industry, we are considered covered entities here. Um, and one thing I really wanna point out is in order to be compliant in HIPAA, it is a whole team effort. You really can't have uh, HIPAA compliance if only the doctor is uh, working hard and making sure that there's policies and procedures uh, we've seen that it, all it takes is one team member to access, uh, you know, a website that they shouldn't have to have a system hack. So we really want to make sure that everybody on the team gets training uh, and that they understand what the HIPAA privacy rules are, different components such as the privacy and the security rule. So that's going to be very important that we establish first is training. Uh, with training, we want to make sure that we're keeping accurate training records as well. So every member of the team needs to be trained regardless of what position they hold in the facility because they're all at some point going to have access to protected health information. Uh, whether it's different information, you know, the clinical team is going to be looking at medical histories and treatment planning. The front desk is going to maybe look at um, insurance information, but regardless, it's still all protected health information. So when employees first get hired in, we wanna make sure that they go through HIPAA training. And then we wanna make sure that we do HIPAA training continually 
as a team uh, annually after that. And documentation that we need to keep is information like names of the trainees that were present, what topics were covered during your training. Um, and you wanna make sure that you keep these records for at least three years. Need to know basis. So something that's very important and it's sometimes hard. I know I've worked in a dental facility for over 10 years, so I know it can be challenging sometimes, but making sure that we're keeping that patient information confidential and that we're not sharing it or talking about patients when there's no need. We're not providing any treatment for them. So as uh, healthcare providers, as dental providers, we want to make sure that we're not opening patient charts if we're not uh, treating them at that point, or if we don't need to contact them for a reason. And we want to make sure that we're only discussing patient information with uh, individuals that are going to be providing treatment for, for our patients. And where I see this kind of uh, go uh, bad is when we have patients, we've seen them for, for years, it's a dental family, I understand that, but then sometimes you know, dental staff starts gossiping, starts talking about the treatment that they need, the broken tooth that they had, um, when in reality, all this conversation is really not doing anything to help treat the patient. So we just want to make sure that as a dental team, we keep remembering that the information that we have is confidential. Our patients are really trusting us with it. So we need to protect it and not be sharing information when we don't need to be. Also, as uh, employees, as team members, we need to understand how to properly disclose or share protected health information with business associates, contractors, or other entities that we may partner up with. Business associates are uh, organizations like shredding services, collection agencies, different businesses that are going to help us but aren't necessarily employees of our dental practice. So we need to make sure that whoever we're working with, that they're following HIPAA rules and are HIPAA compliant, just like we are. And a way for us to do that is to make sure that we have a business associate agreement signed with them. So that, that's going to be key here. We wanna make sure that we have documentation of that. Patient authorization as well. It's very important when we, need to get authorization to share information about a patient, disclose information about a patient. So there are certain cases when we don't need a patient's permission to share information, like when we're treating the patient and, or when we're trying to get payment from an insurance company. But um, if you know a patient wants their chart sent to uh, another office that you know, you've never heard of, you need to get permission uh, for from the patient to do that. Or you know, if a patient family member comes in and asks for patient information, you need to make sure that you have permission to do that. So employees need to understand when patient authorization is needed and how to properly get it as well. A big part of making sure that we're HIPAA compliant as well is um, implementing the notice of privacy practices. So the notice of privacy practices it is information that we provide all our patients that will explain to them how we as a facility are going to use their protected health information, how we're going to protect it, um, and if for some reason we need to disclose it, how we're going to do so. Uh, the notice of privacy practices needs to be given to all new patients when they first come into our facility. And uh, there's a couple other areas where we need to make sure that they're available as well. Uh, first, we need to make sure that we have hard copies available in our facilities in case patients ever request them. And now I can tell you being involved in the dental facility for over 10 years, there's only been one time where a patient came up and uh, requested a copy of it. So it doesn't happen often but we do wanna make sure that we have it available in case they ask. Um, the other place where we need to have this notice of privacy practice present is somewhere visible in our facilities where patients can access. So it could be you know, the patient waiting room, it could be the checkout area where patients come and 
schedule their next appointment. Uh, as long as it's somewhere where they can easily look at, uh, we wanna make sure that we have that posted somewhere. And the last place where we wanna make sure we have uh, the notice of privacy practices is in our website. So it should live somewhere within our homepage. Um, I've seen some facilities that just have it written down there at the bottom of their homepage. I've seen other dental facilities that'll have a button with a link to the um, notice of privacy practices. So either way works, we just wanna make sure that it's embedded in our homepage somehow if you do have a website for your office. Now, something that's so key in making sure that we're being compliant and not getting into trouble, uh, both to protect our patients and our business as well, is to have a disaster recovery plan. A uh, disaster recovery plan is also known as a contingency plan. And it's a process that we wanna establish as soon as possible if we don't have one established yet in order to make sure that we're protecting our health information of our patients. Unfortunately for us, we are targets for hackers and people that want access to individual information. You think about it, there's not very many other places besides medical and dental facilities where so much information about a single patient is stored. We have a patient's name, we have their social security number, their phone number, their home address. We have family member names, uh, medical histories, insurance information. Sometimes we even have credit card information on file from patients. So it's very appealing for some hackers there to try to get into our dental systems and get us into trouble here. So we wanna make sure that we have protocols in place for different types of disasters, whether it's a natural disaster, like the flooding of one of our facilities, if a fire happens, if there's vandalism or someone tries to break into our facility, uh, we wanna make sure that we have protocols in place for that. Uh, but we also wanna make sure that we have protection uh, from the internet. So cyber attacks, ransomware. Uh, there needs to be a way for us as dental facilities and providers to restore the data if for some reason it's ever compromised. So this is a contingency plan that, uh, you wanna have different copies throughout the facility, easy to access. And this recovery plan is something that is going to be key for you to establish with your IT professional. They are going to be able to implement data backup, data restoration. Uh, so we wanna make sure that you are working very closely with an IT professional that understands the dental industry and that understands HIPAA because they are going to be able to properly put in place systems to help restore your data. We've seen so many incidents before where data gets compromised and the IT professional is a family member or friend and they're great at IT, but they just don't understand dental. And we've gotten in trouble. Some offices have gotten in trouble because of that. Uh, we are constantly seeing facilities not having this contingency plan. And what we see often happen is um, hackers coming in, holding facilities ransom. So what they'll do is they'll hack into a computer or a system. And then the next day when doctor and team come in, they see their computers uh, blacked out with a message saying that uh, if they need support to call this 800 number. So when they call the 800 number, they get great customer service, but they say that if you want your information back, that you have to pay a fee. And for these doctors that don't have a recovery plan, they don't have encrypted backup or restoration, they're forced to pay the fine. Uh, but what we've seen is those doctors that do have this contingency plan, they've worked with their IT professional, they know what they're doing, when they come in and they see a message like that and their screens, they can just ignore it. They work with their IT, they get the backup of their information, they restore the data, and they can be up and running seeing patients within a matter of hours sometimes. So that's why it's really important 
that we make sure that these disaster recovery plans are put in place in your facility. So this is an example, actually. I'm not sure some of you might have heard about it in the news of what can happen if there's no contingency plan. And in this case, it was not a dental facility that got hacked. It was actually an IT company that got hacked uh, that was working with dental facilities. So what happened is the hacker went in through the back of the IT company, encrypted the software. So when the IT company tried to go in, they couldn't read any of their data. Um, and because of this, hundreds of offices across the country were affected. After several days of uh, facilities not being able to treat patients, this IT company finally decided to pay the ransom, which is was about a few million dollars that they had to pay. Um, so it was very expensive. Obviously, a lot of offices lost uh, patients, lost, lost production because they couldn't access any information. Um, so this is just an example of what can happen if we don't have that contingency plan present. Uh, you also want to make sure that at least once a year, you conduct a risk analysis. A risk analysis is the process of conducting a thorough assessment of any potential risks and vulnerabilities in your facility. And this is going to range anything from making sure that you have you know, encryption in your systems to that you're making sure you're training the team properly. It's gonna be a big encompassing risk assessment where you can pinpoint any potential areas where your facility might be vulnerable when it comes to HIPAA compliance. And this risk analysis is going to incorporate a lot of safeguards that we might have to implement or modify if we do find some vulnerabilities here. So speaking of safeguards, there are three types of safeguards that are present in all dental facilities that are going to help keep patient information safe. The first is administrative. Uh, administrative safeguards really compromise a lot of um, documents, written policies, your day-to-day -day operations, how you're going to securely uh, keep information safe for patients and what your day-to-day -day steps are. And it's going to include information like who your HIPAA security officer is, the facility, so who patients would go to if they have any concerns. Then we have physical safeguards, uh, actual like physical barriers, things that limit physical access to something. Uh, now, what is great about HIPAA is that it's flexible and scalable, which means that we know every facility is different, so the needs uh, to protect information are going to be different for everybody. Uh, so an example uh, could be, let's, let's talk about a server. We have some offices that have a smaller server, they can put a server cage and that is going to be considered a physical barrier. We have some facilities that are larger, they keep their server in a closet and they lock it and only a couple members of the team that uh, like the doctor and the office manager will have access to it. Uh, some offices uh, may just have an alarm system that's that barrier to keep um, individuals that shouldn't have access to it away. So physical barriers may look different depending on your facility and that's okay. And then third, we have technical safeguards. And this, these are really technology oriented in order to help protect our EPHI or electronic protected health information. This is where the IT professional is also going to be key in making sure that your facility is being compliant and HIPAA. We know that we might, we might know that we need encryption, we might know we need firewalls, but you know, we're healthcare providers, right? We don't know how to actually set that up in our system. So we have to rely on our IT professionals to properly set up these firewalls and encrypted backups and virus protections that we may need in our system.
phones, uh, they're great, but they also have the ability to cause a lot of problems in dentistry for us. So we've seen that mobile devices are one of the most common causes of HIPAA violations right now. As covered entities, as doctors uh, and staff, we need to make sure that we keep these mobile devices secure. Uh, we're not leaving them unattended. They should be encrypted. And this is not only mobile devices, but tablets and laptops too. I know a lot of times uh, team members or, or doctor wants to take work home with them. Um, and that's okay, but we want to make sure that if we are going to use a device or take a device outside of a facility, um, that we're still keeping that information about a patient secure. So it is our responsibility to make sure no patient information is compromised, regardless of what device we're using. This is actually an example of a breach that took place in in a dental facility that we were working with uh, and it had to do with phones. So I thought I'd add it here and kind of use this an, as an example. But in this case, there was an associate doctor that had just graduated from dental school. So he was really excited and he had built a group uh, in his phone of new graduates, his teammates, his uh, classmates. And what they would do is they would send pictures to each other or x-rays to each other and then they describe the treatment plan that they had proposed and they'd ask for suggestions or to see if there was anything else that they were missing. Uh, now, unfortunately for this associate doctor, the x-rays that he was sending them included the patient's name in them. So remember, patient's name is protected health information. So he was really compromising um, the facility there. Uh, when the when the facility found out, when the employer found out that this had been taken place, uh, the associate doctor was fired, um, and it did put the practice at risk for a HIPAA investigation. He didn't mean to do it, but um, it was still uh, information about patients was still living the facility in an unsecure method. So again, if you're going to be using cell phones, be careful um, how you're transmitting information. Now, a question we get a lot about phones as well is uh, patients or employees trying to take pictures for social media. If you are going to be using cell phone devices to take pictures of patients and, and putting them up on your Facebook page, uh, just remember that you do need patient authorization. So uh, make sure you get a signature from the patient or a parent if it's needed in order to do that. Okay, so once you've, if you haven't implemented what we've just been talking about, make sure that when you go back to your office, you implement some of these best practices and have those policies in place. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different fines uh, or citations that we might find uh, with HIPAA. And the fines are really based on the level of negligence. And so with the HIPAA law or HIPAA standard, these are the four levels or the four types that are listed. The first one is no knowledge. Uh, this is when a violation takes place, the business owner didn't know about, um, and when an investigation takes place, the penalty can be $100 per violation to a maximum of $25,000 per calendar year. Now I can tell you being involved with HIPAA, HIPAA inspections uh, for many years, we've never seen a known knowledge. A lot of times uh, what we'll see is uh, the Office of Civil Rights wanting some sort of corrective action. Uh, the next one is reasonable cause. This is where uh, a violation was not willful neglect, so there was no intent in harm there, but the um, violation still took place. So with this type of violation, uh, it could be up to $1,000 per violation with a total that does not uh, exceed 100,000 in the calendar year. Okay, then we have willful neglect violation. There are two types. One is willful neglect corrected. And this is when an office had some sort of HIPAA violation. They knew they weren't doing something 
correct. They did it anyways. In this case, they're usually given a chance to amend their policy within 30 days. Um, but if they do, if the Office of Civil Rights does find um, a violation there or penalty, they can find uh, $10,000 per violation with a sum not exceeding of 250,000 per calendar year. Then you have last willful neglect that's not corrected. This is again, willful neglect. So the office, doctor's doing something they know they shouldn't be doing, they're not being compliant, uh, but then they keep doing it even after uh, they've been given the opportunity to correct the action. So for this, uh, penalty, the per, the, for each violation, it could be $50,000 with a sum not exceeding a million and a half per calendar year for each violation. So it can be very expensive to not follow HIPAA law. We want to make sure that uh, we're doing best practices that I've discussed today, that we are training our team. We have policies in place because uh, we want to make sure that we're not in um, not getting ourselves in these situations. Now I've added a couple scenarios here of um, some HIPAA incidents because I think it it helps when when we hear some of these examples, but also I think it it's something that we can all really relate to on some of these. So in this case, HIPAA did receive a complaint uh, from a patient saying that the office disclosed protected health information, their name and their medical condition, and they had no authorization to do so. In this case, this patient had actually put um, a bad review on Yelp of this office um, and the office manager or the administrative member of the team who was in charge of social media was trying to respond to the post and when she did it, she did disclose patient information. Now, even though the patient initiated the post and the patient might have added uh, information about herself, the office did not have authorization to share any information that they had about the patient. And I know sometimes it's frustrating. Trust me, um, I'm in the dental office all the time where sometimes you get a bad review, Oftentimes you, you see that it's a patient that maybe didn't want to pay the bill. It's not necessarily that they didn't like the doctor. They were fine when they left the office. Um, and you want to just respond to try to clarify what it is that happened. Uh, but we really have to be careful how we answer these reviews because we can't be sharing any patient information. In this case, uh, the practice agreed to pay $10,000 to the Office of Civil Rights. And they had to build a corrective action plan and, and show that this incident wouldn't happen again in the future. Here's another example. And this is, this is something we see happen often. And again, it's another frustration. But we do have to follow HIPAA law here. In this case, a uh, patient asked for their records to a dental facility, um, and the dental facility did not provide the records to the patient in a timely manner. Um, and I know sometimes, you know, you, you get patients and uh, they get treatment done and they don't pay the bill. And next thing you know, you're, they're asking for the records and you just want to hold those records hostage because uh, you want them to pay the bill or there's a fee associated in um, releasing those records that uh, they don't want to pay. But at the end of the day, uh, the patient chart, the information, they have a right to access it. So we want to make sure that um, we provide that information to them within 30 days. Uh, in this case, this facility didn't do that. Um, so the patient went and complained again to the Office of Civil Rights saying that she did not receive her records. And in this case, the office um, ended up paying $3,500 to the Office of Civil Rights. And again, they had to adopt a corrective action. And this is what we see most of the time is besides that fine that they have to pay, there's also a corrective action involved um, that they need to turn in as well.
And this is an example. This is a big uh, fine that happened, a 1.5 million. It didn't happen to a dental facility, uh, but I think it's just a great example of uh, why we need to make sure that we're really following uh, all these policies and best practices that I'm talking about today. In this case, there was an unencrypted laptop that had protected health information of patients that was stolen. Uh, when the Office of Civil Rights investigated, they started seeing lots of things that weren't taking place in this facility. There wasn't any training. There was no uh, risk analysis performed. There weren't no security measures for portable devices. So they weren't encrypted. Uh, the IT professional wasn't working with them. And so seeing all these things, it added up to a fines that equaled $1.5 million. So again, something we don't want to um, have to deal with or ever encounter in our facilities. Besides um, fines that we may encounter, there's other consequences that can go along with not being compliant um, with HIPAA. So if for some reason we encounter a HIPAA breach, and what I mean by a breach is when unencrypted information leaves our facility and um, somebody has the ability to access it that shouldn't access it. So, um, you know, members of our team um, are within the facility, but anything that leaves our facility. Uh, first, it can create loss of business. We are required to notify patients if there was a breach in their information. Um, so it's not a good day when we have to call our patients and tell them that, you know, their information is out there. Um, they're not going to trust us like they, but like they trusted before, and they might even leave our facilities if this happens. So uh, that's something we don't want to see. Um, also, we need to conspicuously post for 90 days on our website homepage what happened. And this can really affect um, a business as well. I know I, I'm a patient at the University of Michigan Hospital, and I tried to log into my patient portal one day and in big red block letters, there was an alert saying that the laptop of a healthcare provider had been stolen. Um, and it did instruct patients that uh, were treated in that department to call this 800 number um, in order to get more information or to get their questions answered. Um, and it just doesn't look good. I, I did feel bad at that point. That's something that I don't want happening to your facilities either. Uh, besides that, if a breach does take place, uh, we need to notify Health and Human Services of the breach. And lastly, if enough patients are involved in the breach, so if 500 or more records have somehow been compromised, and if we think about it between active and inactive patients, um, there's a high likelihood that if a breach were ever to take place in our facilities, um, it would be for over 500 charts. We are required to hold a press release for the local media explaining what happened. So again, that's not a good day for our facilities if we have to go on the news and tell them that our patient information was compromised. Uh, patients are not going to be happy. Again, they might leave. Um, we're not going to get a good reputation here. So it's, this is why it's very important that we're following this. There's lots of things that can go wrong. Here. Now, HIPAA inspections are usually triggered by a patient complaint. So a patient's not happy about something that happened in your facility, so they call the Office of Civil Rights. Um, usually what happens if there is a patient complaint is the Office of Civil Rights will contact you um, and initiate a letter. And in this letter, they'll, uh, they'll tell you what the allegations were, um, and then they'll also ask for records of training and policies uh, for you to turn into them. What we see oftentimes is when they send this letter and you send the response back with copies of training records and your written policies, um, oftentimes that's like where <laughs> the investigation stops. Um, they're satisfied knowing that you're you're holding training, that you have written policies in place, 
Um, but if they see that a violation did take place, they're going to further investigate. And these are the things that they they look at with the investigation. So they want to make sure that whatever the complaint was, it took place after the rule took effect. So long time ago here, privacy rule 2003, security rule 2005. So they need to make sure that whatever allegation is taking place, it's done so after these years. It also uh, needs to show that the complaint is filed against an entity required by law to comply with the privacy and security rule. Um, now for us, this is the case we are considered covered entities. Um, it also asks that um, if for some reason they can prove that the violation did take place, that it would violate the privacy or security rule of, um, of HIPAA. And complaints need to be filed within 180 days of when uh, the person or patient uh, submitted knew about the allegation. So uh, once all this information is gathered, uh, the Office of Civil Rights will look into it, further investigate, and if they do find that uh, a facility did violate some sort of HIPAA rule or, or law, that's when um, the, the fines will be given. They're also going to perform education and outreach. So as you saw with the different examples, they gave facilities a fine, but they also asked for corrective action. Okay, what I wanna do now is uh, give you a resource that will help see how in compliance your facility is um, and, and uh, hopefully make you see where those vulnerabilities are. We talked about vulnerabilities and the risk analysis. So what we would like to do is we would like to give you access to our HIPAA audit checklist so that when you go back to the office, you can review this. And again, it'll pinpoint if there's any areas we want to make sure that you improve on to be HIPAA compliant. Now, there's two ways you can access this. You can access it through your mobile device. Um, I, I always have my phone on me and, you know, it's easy to carry it around the office uh, to do this audit checklist. So if you're a phone person, what you can do is you can download the Compliance Training Partners app in your Android or your iPhone. Um, you can create a login and then you can select your audit that you want. Now we do do OSHA and infection control training as well besides HIPAA. So those checklists are going to be available to you as well if you do want to see where your compliance is. But as far as HIPAA, what you want to do is you want to hit the HIPAA compliance audit checklist. When you go back into the office and it's going to give you a questionnaire pretty easy to follow. They're all yes or no questions. So go through the audit, answer all the questions. And then once you have completed it, it's going to give you a detailed report. Uh, it's going to list anything that you answered no to or that you don't have implemented. It's going to give you suggestions on what to do next in order to make sure that you're compliant in that area. Um, so ideally, what we want to see is uh, have that whole circle look green at some point um, after completing that audit. Now, if you're a desktop person, uh, you can access this audit checklist uh, through compliancetrainingpartners.com. Again, you can log in with an account, um, select the compliance checklist that you want, and begin the audit. The Audit is going to be the same, whether you do your phone or your desktop. Um, again, very easy, yes or no questions, uh, things like, you know, do you have a HIPAA coordinator appointed in your facility? Um, so you'll go through and just like with the app, you're going to be able to view the results. Um, anything in red that you aren't compliant with, at the bottom, it'll give you recommendations on what to do in order to achieve compliance in the future here. Okay, 
And I know that when you registered, uh, you were asked whether or not you wanted a complimentary demo uh, for comply. Um, and what we've talked about so far, the risk, the risk analysis, this is great. Um, but I do encourage you, if you are going to get an um, invite to a demo, if you selected yes, in order to see a demo for comply. And comply is a great comprehensive system for HIPAA compliance, also OSHA and infection control. So it's a great place to have all your compliance together. Um, it comes with training. So the required training that you and your whole team is going to need, it's going to have, uh, come with support and lots of oversight. So make sure that if you get that link, um, you, you go in and you just check out the demo. I think it's going to help all of you uh, with your HIPAA compliance, especially if you're just starting out and need a place and guidance for it. Um, if you, for some reason, didn't click yes, but it's something that interests you in seeing how you know, you can get overall compliance with this program, I left the website on the bottom here of the screen, uh, compliancetrainingpartners.com slash comply, and you can, um, you can request a short demo there as well if you for some reason, click no, and we're interested in doing that. So with that, Adam, I guess I'll turn it over to you and see if there are any um, questions. Of course, thank you. We've got some time left, so if anyone has questions, drop them in the chat and Q&A. We will get right to it. Um, let's see, the first one that came in, if a patient asks for his x-rays and the dentist charges a fee for that, is that considered a HIPAA violation? No, it's not. Offices are able to charge a, a fee, a printing fee, um, but what they can't do is hold records for over 30 days. So our recommendation uh, for you there is Hold off until the 30 days, but once the 30 days hit, if they still haven't paid, you, you need to um, turn those x-rays over. And, and I get that's very frustrating. It happens in our facility too, but remember it's noted within the notice of privacy practices. It does discuss that patients have, act, have the right to access, change, and obtain their records. Um, so we need to provide that to them within 30 days. Right. And I think if I'm understanding this question correctly, it seems to be asking if you're communicating with one of the doctors and you're treating a mutual patient, can you, uh, must the name of the patient be excluded in the text message? Uh, no, you can add, you can add a patient name, but what you don't want to do is have a conversation about their treatment or treatment plan through text messages. Um, and and this is something that we get a lot of questions on with phones and texts and what can you and can you not add. Um, I know a lot of offices or facilities, for example, like to use like uh, text messages to confirm appointments. And that's fine, too. You can communicate via text. Just don't put in detail. So don't put in, you know, um, Dr. Smith is waiting for you or you have an appointment with Dr. Smith next week for your core and crown. Um, keep it like, you know, you have an appointment with Dr. Smith next week and um, avoid sharing detailed information about patients and their treatment plan via text. I am able to access my office computer and our dental software from my home computer. One associate has an office laptop to access remotely, and this is both via log me in. Um, mm -hmm. Another associate uses a Google product on her phone to access her office desktop and dental software. What precautions need to be taken besides passwords? So this is a great question and something that um, you want to go over with your IT professional, um, depending on the software and everything. They're going to be the ones to really be able to figure out the best way to en encrypt the software, whether you need a like a VPN, like virtual private network, so that um, it adds almost like a barrier so people can't hack into your Wi-Fi and then into your computer after that. Um, so it's situations like this where it's very important to have an IT professional that understands uh, the needs of, of dental providers to make sure that they're keeping the network secure. Um, are you required to have a HIPAA privacy form? 
a HIPAA privacy form. Um, I've, that that um, that wording is a little vague. I'm not entirely sure what they mean by a HIPAA privacy uh, form. Um, there needs to be different documentations, like an authorization form, to give patients that um, where they write down, you know, who they give you permission to share information with. Um, I, I don't know if that's what you're referring to, or the notice of privacy practices that talks about, you know, patient privacy and how we're going to access their information. Um, they need to have that available too to give to the patient. Um, I don't know if you, if whoever asked that is referring to something else, but if they could elaborate, I'd be able to answer that question a little bit better. For sure, Jim, if you're still out there, let us know and we will get a, a clear answer to you. Um, let's see. Do we have to have a records release if a patient is transferring out of our office to another dental office? Yeah, you still want to have record of, um, of a patient authorizing you to send records from one facility to another. Um, <laughs> lots of questions to choose from. Can we email the records and x-rays of a patient to themselves? Yes, you can. Um, it's, patients often request that a lot. Uh, what you want to make sure, though, again, is even though you're going to send it to the patient, make sure that you're getting that authorization form uh, written down where they provide that email address. Uh, because when you're sending it from um, your system to the patient, it might not have encryption or the, the adequate protection that it would if you were emailing uh, something to another dental provider. So as long as you have record that they gave you permission to release those records to whatever email address they provide, that's fine. So, um, okay, uh, so can we send x-rays to other offices or over, over normal email or do we need to use a secured email? Um, so if it's just an x-ray, that's different, but most of the time it'll have a patient name or patient information um, and that's considered protected health information. So you do, want to make sure that you have some sort of encrypted software in your system. Um, there's some out there that are really cool, actually. They, um, they'll be able to identify whether a patient's name or social security number or protected health information is disclosed in an email and automatically encrypt it for you if you need to. But you do need to have uh, some sort of encryption system in your, in your emails that get sent out. Is it a HIPAA violation to send non-secure emails like Yahoo or Gmail to a referring doctor? If it has protected health information, again, like a patient name, um, then yes, it needs to be encrypted. Uh, any recommendations for a risk assessment? I've used the one from the ADA manual and it is quite complex. Yeah, so if you... Uh, go to um, either our app or our website, you'll be able to go through our audit checklist, which will help you with your risk analysis there. Um, and can you remind what the app name is called? Oh, so you can just uh, search compliance training partners on the app. Um, that, that's what you'll find us under. Perfect. Um, do, do we have to have our records? Oh, I think I asked that one already. Um, our, patient our patient communication service allows us to send intake forms to patients. Can we use the software to send x-ray release, release of information authorizations, et cetera, when the patient signs the form with an electronic signature? Um, it, you mean if a patient... Sorry, can you read that one again? Yeah, I kind of a loaded a question. <laughs> um, our patient communication service allows us to send intake forms to patients. Can we use the software to send x-ray release, release of information authorizations, and et cetera, when the patients sign the forms with an electronic signature? Yeah, so that um, that's a great question. I think that's something that... Um, will probably be able to be answered better by the IT professional that you work with than I 
can answer today, but um, I know that if the patient intake forms are sent out and there's encryption within the system, um, that as long as the system is encrypted, we should be able to use it. Tell you what, lots of x-ray questions tonight. <laughs> um, okay. Is it okay to send x-rays to the specialists I refer my patient to without their permission? Yes, it is. Um, if, if the patient knows that you're referring them to that doctor, I know that in our facility, for example, um, there's an oral surgeon that we're always working with. So when we have a kid that needs um, wisdom teeth extraction, we give them the referral um, and we send the x-rays to that oral surgeon that day without that patient authorization um, so that when the patient goes in for their appointment, the x-ray is already there. Uh, the only time I would say make sure that you do get an authorization is if uh, you get a request from an office you've never really been involved with or not familiar with. You want to make sure that you have record of who you're sending those um, x-rays to. Do I have to use the protected email to send the x-rays when I only use first initial plus the last name? Uh, yeah, I would still make sure that you're using um, encrypted email. Can I say the details of the procedure and a voicemail to, to a patient? Uh, I, uh, I would not do that um, unless you have authorization to do that. Uh, I would keep things very broad. What I would recommend you do is if you do need to talk to a patient about their treatment and that you can't get them on the phone, um, give them a call, leave them a message saying that you're calling in regards to uh, treatment that they have in the facility to please give you a call back. But um, I would not leave that in an answering machine. You don't know who else has access to it. Um, so yeah, any detailed information like that, make sure you talk to the patient directly. Do you have any suggestions for secure email services? Um, yeah, I know uh, Henry Shine has one that they provide. I can get the um, name of it later for you if you want, but they have a great one. And there that's one that, again, it like automatically encrypts emails if it detects any protected health information for you. Um, but I do know Henry Shine does provide some of those services. I don't know what that says about me. I wasn't aware of that. So thank you for bringing <laughs> that to my attention. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, uh, lots of email questions here. What else do we have? What are examples of records that could be released? So any record can be released if you have uh, patient permission or authorization to do so. All right. Uh, can I say the details of the procedure to a person who is listed as an emergency contact? Um, if it's yeah, if it's essential for patient care, yes. I'd ideally like to see that emergency contact as a name that they have in the authorization form as well. Um, but if you need to talk to somebody because it's an emergency, then by the patient putting them as a contact, you're able to talk to them about whatever is needed in that case. It's an emergency, so. Uh, we already have someone who downloaded the Compliance Training Partners app, and it's asking them for login information, but they don't see an option to sign up. How would they go about signing up? Um, if you send an email to help at Compliance Training Partners, uh, you will uh, get you will get a walkthrough uh, by Julie. She's our training director, and she's an expert on the app there. So, um, if you send her an email or if you give us a call, um, we'll be at the office tomorrow. Um, they'll be able to walk you through it and make sure that you get access to it. Perfect. Rolling right along. Are there any penalties for us if someone else sends us an unencrypted email? No. Uh, what are examples? We answered that one. Can a verbal request from a can a verbal request from the patient to transfer their X-rays to another office? Uh, hold on. Can a verbal request from the patient? Can there Maybe can there be a verbal request from the patient to transfer their x-rays to another office? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think I think I know what they're talking about. I know sometimes patients call and they're sitting in the chair of a specialist waiting for x-rays and they didn't have a written authorization form. Um, uh, a verbal authorization is okay. You want to put it in the charts, but what, what ideally uh, would be best if you could do is uh, email the authorization form over or fax it over and have it have them send it right back so you can have it written, but I know sometimes there's emergency. So as long as you talk to the patient um, and get authorization uh, in written form later, that's okay. We send x-rays and claim forms to insurance with patient's information. Is that safe to do? Yes. And actually that's uh, part of the privacy rule. This wasn't HIPAA trading, so I couldn't go over everything HIPAA related, but uh, one of the ways we can disclose information without patient authorization is uh, for payment. So with our insurance companies, and I know oftentimes if you're doing a crown, they're going to request an x-ray, or if you're doing um, scaling and root planning, they're going to want the periodontal chart for that. Um, and if that's the case, you're able to send it, no problem. Uh, do we have to, oh, where to go? Do we have to frequently change our password? And if so, how often? Um, you should be changing your passwords. Uh, I know it's something that we don't get into ha the habit of. I know I'm really bad at always putting in the same password and everything. Um, there's no actual requirement as to how often you need to do it. Um, but I would say, you know, every couple of months, try to change it up a little bit. Um, all right. Uh, if, is it a recommendation or a requirement to do a risk analysis every year? You, you are required. You should be doing a risk analysis every year. If patients give the office a call requesting records to be sent, is it okay to release them? Yes, but remember, you still want to make sure you get that authorization form signed. Do I need a written signed permission to take pictures if I'm not planning to put them up on social media? and it's just for my records and insurance company? Uh, no, you, it, I, I'm, guessing some t I'm guessing you're talking about um, like pictures for like Invisalign cases or something like that. Um, if you're gonna be taking pictures like that, uh, you don't need patient authorization, but you do wanna make sure that whatever devices that you're doing is kept secure. So if you use your phone, uh, make sure that there's a password to get into the phone. Um, or, or that you keep it in a, in, in a drawer, in a locked area, uh, whatever you can do to minimize access there. When we refer a patient, sometimes the office that is referred to asks for a patient's forms through email. Is it okay to send, I guess, it, is it okay to send x-ray via email? I think we answered that, but is yes. it in general just okay to send the forms through email as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, do we have to, oh, password answered that getting to the end here. Uh, for an adult disabled patient who is not capable of deciding, are we supposed to ask for legal documents like power of attorney from parents before reviewing treatment plan with the parents? Yes. And I know these can be very uncomfortable um, discussions to have. And we usually get this case with um, adults that are disabled. Um, or, you know, if a, if a kid comes in and the babysitter brings them in, what information can we share with the patient? So we want to make sure that we do have whoever that legal guardian is put in the authorization form, um, who's able to, to access uh, patient information, who we can discuss information with. Um, so we do want to have some sort of documentation as to who we can talk to and who we can't. And what if the guardian does not have any document with them? What should you do? You can always ask them to um, email it to you later on or, or you know, bring it in next time they come in. Um, but you want to make sure that you get that um, document scanned in or in the patient chart um, as soon as possible. Do you know if an email account from Google Business is encrypted or not? You know, I know that they have an encryption software. I'm not entirely sure if it's HIPAA compliant or not. Um, so again, that would be a question for 
IT, whether it's secure enough to send PHI that way or if you need something else. If we send records of release forms via email to a patient, does the patient have to get it notarized before they email it back? Nope. Mm -mm. They can just sign it and send it right back. Can we text estimate copays if we do not mention the patient's name? Yeah, you can. And you know, if you get authorization from a patient saying it's okay to communicate via text, you are able to communicate with them that way, but you want to make sure that you have permission to share that information with them. Um, like I have my orthodontist um, contacts me through text. They know that, you know, I, they know I'm not good at answering the phone sometimes because I'm out doing trainings. Um, and so a method they have for communication um, is text and it, it's okay to do that. Uh, we just want to be careful with the information that we share. We want to make sure that if we are sharing information via text that um, the patient gives us authorization to do so. Perfect. Well, I think we just knocked out like 40 questions in 20 minutes. So that might be a record for me. All right, that's great. <laughs> and we're ending almost I, right on time. So I think we got through all the questions. If I missed any, or if you have any that you think of after the fact, please email help at compliance training partners.com, or you can go to compliance training partners.com or email us at webinars at henry And we will route your questions accordingly. Uh, thank you everyone for all the questions, Andrea. Thank you, especially for your time and all the super great and important content. We did record tonight's webinar. So keep an eye out for the email coming sometime in the next week. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you, Adam.